so much, Ian. Uh, have a seat and I'll invite uh, uh, Eva Shearlink and uh, Professor Alan Fells uh, to join you uh, for, the, um, for the panel discussion to follow now. Lessons from the Royal Commission and the Productivity uh, Commissions. Now, we've, we really would like you to ask questions uh, throughout this session. So what I'm going to get you to do is have a look at your app. You have to select the right room. We're in Arena 1. Arena 1, and you look under Polls and Live Q&A in the app. Polls and Live Q&A, and then Arena 1. And those questions will come through uh, to the screens in front of me, and I'll ask them. Or you can stick your hand in the air like you used to do at school, and somebody apparently will find you with a microphone. So there you go. Uh, so uh, our fourth member of the panel couldn't be here. It's the wonderful Adele Ferguson. Uh, Adele was recognised in the Australia Day Honours for, um, for the work she did uh, on the abuse of people um, who were uh, customers of um, insurance companies and 7-Eleven and all the rest of it. She has done some extraordinary work. So what we're going to do is ask the panel uh, to give us their initial remarks. We'll have recorded remarks from Adele and then we'll go through a series of questions that we'll play, uh, ask to all of the members of the panel uh, coming to your questions at the end. Uh, so who would like to go first? Ian's had uh, a, a, a chat. Perhaps Alan, would you like to begin? Does that sound right? Okay, well, thank you. Um, Hain, well, uh, it exposed, and it deserves credit for Sorry. its exposure and its really strong condemnation of widespread, very bad practices by banks and other financial institutions, including retail super. Uh, of course, members for profits came out of it very well. What I was uh, a little surprised at was the mismatch of uh, this exposure and condemnation and uh, the actual somewhat modest remedies that right. were proposed. Uh, and the big banks actually as institutions, in my view, got off a bit lightly. Some individuals have paid more, will pay a price, some will be prosecuted and so on, but there is less uh, impact on the organisations as such than I thought should have occurred. So, um, Hain uh, basically, uh, despite that strong condemnation, took a relatively conservative approach, he relied very heavily on regulation and changed culture uh, to fix the situation, um, to put things right. Um, he's also come up with some legislative proposals um, and to some extent uh, there's been a bit of picking on slightly lesser issues, I mean there are issues about mortgage brokers and so on, <coughs> but he did emphasise uh, at the very beginning of the report that the key responsibility lay at the top levels of financial institutions, boards and senior executives and then the measures didn't go that deeply um, in, into them. Um, so uh, there were no deep uh, structural uh, changes proposed or really addressed it terribly much. Uh, for example, the question of vertical integration. Should banks uh, put their own products on the market at the same time set up services providing purportedly independent, impartial advice about what were the best products across the whole market? Mm. And the evidence was quite strong that bank advice leads to people buying bank products from that very provider of the advice. Uh, and there were some other structural questions also which I felt needed to be addressed much more deeply, including whether banks should at all be in this field of funds management or in the... Uh, as trustees of super. Um, so this set of potential conflicts of interest 
uh, was addressed with let's do some more regulation and change the culture of the organisations. Um, there was also not a great deal on the difficulties of remuneration uh, and the conflicted remuneration schemes. There were some recommendations, but not very comprehensive. That's a very difficult question. They're very difficult issues, uh, and they need to be pursued more deeply. Uh, there was very little on the remediation schemes, on people that the banks should have handled, now they should give them compensation. Um, I thought that was um, passed over too lightly. So in short, this was a lawyer's report. Um, it had somewhat narrow terms of reference. It was about misconduct and what you immediately do about misconduct, which is to prosecute a few people, to regulate more tightly, to change their culture. It was not really uh, a policy royal commission. It didn't come through with strong policies. It was quite unlike the Productivity Commission report, which is all about policy and about broad aspects of the environment. Um, I would have preferred the Royal Commission to dig in more deeply on the fundamental issues. The recent um, uh, decisions about mortgage broking by the government and by the Labor Party kind of illustrate the problem. That is that uh, there are not available really simple solutions to the problems that were identified with respect to mortgage broking. And the rather simple remedy that he came up with, in my view, didn't really address the complexities, uh. the pro-competition effects of having mortgage brokers and also the problems of charging consumers directly and probably just about killing off the mortgage broking industry. I don't think that was gone into uh, deeply enough. I think that's the way it tends to be um, with lawyer-based um, royal commissions. Um, he could have, he probably needed a bit more time to address some of the deeper policy issues, but typically the sorts of policy issues that are around require a deeper uh, look, a wider set of inputs from many people, a wider consideration of the issues on a kind of continuous basis for a few months with a lot of interchange between the commission and the commissioner and the parties affected, and um, a refinement of proposals and issues. So uh, we didn't get that. We did get quite a bit of it in the Productivity Commission inquiry, and no doubt we'll, we'll uh, talk, talk about yeah. that. Mm. No. Uh, this is interesting because I, I keep coming back to this issue. I present a program called The Drum now on the ABC, and you keep thinking, well, if you were going to reform aged care, or disability services, or superannuation or financial services, would you necessarily only have lawyers in the room coming up with a remedy? And I think that's kind of the point we've arrived at, isn't it? It's, it's Royal Commission by lawyers who think in a lawyerly way uh, about issues, which I think is interesting, but it goes to a, a, a wider breakdown of, uh, of well, our sense that governments govern, yeah? Anyway, there is one I'm not supposed to do this. I'm supposed to ask questions and moderate <laughs> yeah. the panel. <laughs> but should we go to uh, Eva? I was interested to hear what you said about the Royal Commission. Um, you've been asked in these initial remarks to talk about the Royal Commission and the Productivity Commission as well. Is that what you intended here? Because I'd be fascinated to know your thoughts on Best in Show and on all the rest. On Best in Show? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's a ridiculous idea. Um, you know, that's what the default system is. Um, you know, it's, it's there, it's in, um, it's, it's there to provide that safety net. Anyone um, in this country who's defaulted into a super fund should go into a high performing fund. Uh, and, and everyone that's there should be best in show. Just limiting that to 10 funds, I mean, you've got, AIST's got 55 Australian members, um, all doing incredibly well for their members. Now, that doesn't mean, as Ian has said, um, that we couldn't be doing better, um, 
But restricting the market down and becoming more like the banks, I don't think is the answer. Um, we need to make sure that our default system is working properly, that the way that um, members are allocated to those default funds is, is strong and that they're protected. Mm. Sorry, now you were supposed to give two minutes. Have I interrupted your No, flow? not at all. No, I actually, I, mean, I think I'm going to ignore my notes. I, I wanted to, I guess, respond to, to what Alan was saying. Um, I think everybody was really disappointed after, you know, that media hype around all of the public hearings and all of the evidence that came out to then get to the report. I remember, you know, I was with my team in Canberra for the lockup and we came out and we just felt completely deflated. It was just such an anti-climax that we, I think we all expected that there would be recommendations for prosecutions and we would see headlines for days to come about, you know, naming and shaming people and entities that were, that, you know, um, we're going to be recommended for prosecution and further investigation. That, that didn't happen. Having said that, and I have to declare I'm a lawyer, um, so <laughs> I have great respect for you know, a former High Court judge and, and he's thinking on things, um, but uh, I, th I think the commentary in the report, so aside from the 76 specific recommendations, actually has a lot sitting behind it and we will see a lot of ramifications from the report even though it might not look look like it at the outset. Mm. Now Ian, um, uh, you've just given us uh, your thoughts so we might turn to recorded comments we have from Adele Ferguson. Uh, she was asked firstly what surprised you most about the Royal Commission? Here's her response. There were three big shocks for me with the Royal Commission. One was the role of the regulators or the inactivity of them. I always knew that the regulators were captive to the banks in terms of what they let them get away with. But when you actually saw the amount of um, exchange of deals being done and press releases that are, you know, wordsmithed uh, in favour of the banks, that did shock me. The other big shock was with the superannuation industry, just the depth of the conflicts with the retail funds and how APRA had absolutely turned a blind eye to it for years. And to the detriment to millions of people who are out of pocket due to underperformance and uh, you know fees for no service, and the regulator has just been asleep at the wheel. The third thing that really shocked me was just the massive scale in which so many people have been ripped off. It wasn't a few bad apples, it was systemic breaches. Uh, and if you could do me a favour, I know this is not what we agreed, but everybody knows Adele, don't they? They all know Adele's work uh, in exposing what was going on uh, in the banks and Commonwealth Bank and exposing a whole range of uh, vulnerable people being exploited, whether it's 7-Eleven, uh, all the way through. So the second question she was asked, let me look it up on my form, uh, what were the big lessons for the sector? Let's play that one. It might sound a bit harsh, but I'd probably give the final report a five out of 10. And the reason for that is it didn't get to the heart of some of the problems, mm. such as vertical integration, Commissioner Hayne walked straight away from that. Uh, in terms of remediation, he uh, recommended a compensation scheme of last resort, which really doesn't address so many other issues of people who've been done over by the banks and other financial institutions. So that was a deep, deep disappointment. Thirdly, uh, he's talking about the regulators and uh, that they're going to get tougher, so he's giving them more resources and more powers. But that's a real leap of faith. So I hope he's right on that because a lot of this is going to drive change and if it doesn't work then we're going to be back at square one. And finally, it's remuneration. For, for the whole 12 months we heard about bonuses and targets and conflicted remuneration driving poor performance and uh, poor behaviour. And yet when it comes to the final report, he really squibbed on that too, offering APRA a chance to overlook what the banks are doing and also the remuneration committees on the boards to start looking at compliance and other things, which they're already doing. So again, it's another leap of faith that everyone's gonna start doing the right thing. Mm. 
So that's a, that's a consensus, Ian. Uh, he squibbed it. Is that your view? Uh, well, look, I, I think... I think there are three phases to the Royal Commission. Everyone's focusing on what I would call phase two, which is the report. But mm. phase one was 2018, which were the proceedings, mm -hmm. seven fortnights, not enough time. Right. Uh, that's one of the disappointments of it. But given he was to look at misconduct and um, conduct that failed to make community expectations in the Australian financial service sector, that's a heck of a task. Um, he only had a year. He, th he thinks, he thought rather, and I think accurately enough, that to run it the way he did seven fortnights of hearings was the best he could do in the circumstances. In 2018, I don't think there'd be a person here, much less a board represented here, that wasn't talking a heck of a lot about the Royal Commission and in very serious terms. So I think it had a as I said, a convulsing effect yeah. on the industry and not just super, not just financial services. Every senior manager or director you spoke to uh, outside this industry was talking about it and mm. worrying about it. What does it mean for the way they go about their business? So 2018, prior to the report, phase right. one, I think it had a big effect. See, that's, fact, what, that's what Eva was saying. I and mean, Eva was essentially saying, there's a new standard now. It's not what's legal, it's what the community expects. Now, just, Ian, talk to me a little bit more about what you think that means for this sector, because you are, you are saying you've got to ask yourselves the hard questions about not only servicing members, but sustainability. Well, what does it mean? I mentioned just some of the, the questions that, and from Australian Super's point of view, I don't think when I pose those questions to myself that, that I would say I'd give ourselves 10 out of 10 on each of them. But frankly, I look around the super sector and the problems are not all in the retail sector. You see practices that are not consistent with acting in members' best interest. And you can fudge them a bit and saying, well, for most members, this, this approach is better or whatever. We either have to be fair income about it and saying, yeah, that's what this mob that's what we exist for, to act solely in the best interests of members, or we do it most of the time. And community expectations, uh, and we saw it with some of the um, videos earlier, that we do it all of the time. Mm. Eva, on that point, yeah, what, do you, what do you think are the challenges beyond the 76 recommendations in the changed environment? Yeah, well, we're, we're highly likely to have a new government, I think, in a couple of months' time. and. You know, they will implement all the recommendations from from the Royal Commission. There'll be some industry consultation on on how that is implemented and and, and what that looks like. But you know, in in talking with um, the Shadow Treasurer, the, his lens is very much the best interests of members. We are going to make laws, we're going to change things to make sure that the focus is the best interests of members. Um, and that's the lens that, that, um, that Ian's talking about too. So I, I think, Alan, that... Sorry, Evie, you're right. Um, there's a bit of a view that uh, a Labor government is going to be the salvation of industry funds. That right. They'll adopt a pro-industry fund mindset. They will not. They will adopt a best uh, pro-member mindset. And if we're in sync with that, terrific. If we're not, well, we will suffer. But that's, that's what you would expect a national government to do, but they're not going to come in and um, wholly, wholly uh, enact a pro-industry fund, anti-retail fund mindset. We're going to have to do the work ourselves, which of course is the way it should be. Alan, just one question to you before we go to another video from Adele, but um, how do you see this sector in 10, 15 years time? Do you, do you think that we'll end up with the big mega funds that the AFR has been talking about that will dwarf the ASX? Uh, and eat the world. <laughs> yes, yes, I, uh, I, I foresee that there will be a big increase in concentration um, just within the uh, profit for member, member for, mm. sorry, uh, funds. And um, also, um, so incidentally, there will be some very interesting competition questions about mergers at some point, yeah. uh, about abuse of dominance at some point. Now, they're quite a long way off. The abuse of dominance issue is that uh, it always comes up when someone is big and efficient and can underprice or better compete against their competitors, it's immediately labelled by the losers as unfair. 
uh, there is a well-established body of law distinguishing between cases when someone's efficient and when someone's going too far. Mm. But the other thing um, I just mentioned, and I listened to the two speeches somewhat closely, is it seems to me the industry will be very, very different in 10 or 15 years, if not earlier. Uh, and we heard some of the reasons today. Uh, to my mind, there will be much more kind of customization of services, as I would see it, that there'll be a lot more provision of advice to all the different needs of the different members, um, you know, the wealthy ones, the ones close to retirement, and they need different advice from people at the beginning. Mm. Uh, there'll be a bigger range of products. The industry hopefully will be much more dynamic. Uh, and as I've said, customised and differentiated in its treatment of things. So that will be, be a whole, and technology will also have a really big impact. The technology impact on banks is going to be a really big issue. I can see FinTech likely to get in there, have a big role before too long. All right, well, let's hear Adele's answer to the question, what's your view on how the Royal Commission dealt with superannuation? I'm not overly confident that uh, the recommendations will lead to uh, ultimate change, the, the sort of changes that are needed. You know, at the moment, the spotlight's really on the sector, so you've got the regulators talking tough. My concern is what's going to happen when that spotlight's turned off. Are we going to go back to the same old behaviour? Views on that culture change within your own sector. I mean, it would be easy to sit here and talk about culture change in the banks, but I'm not sure that would be productive. Well, there's one thing I do want to say about the banks. Mm. Um, in, superannu in the superannuation fortnight of hearings, there were going to be 14 witnesses. Yeah. <clears throat> I was the second witness and was going to be on late on day one or early day two. I didn't get on till late on day four. One institution was in there for the best part of four days. That was NAB or Newless, um, and you know, they've, they've copped the hammering that everybody is aware of. Um, and I must say, I had thought that that concentration on one witness, yeah. uh, one case study, for almost half of the super fortnight was going to be used to say, you've heard the uh, witness evidence, but there's a whole lot of documentary evidence in relation to the other three banks, and it's pretty consistent, and so yeah. we've got a general view. I was very surprised when the report came out which really singled out NAB. So I'm not, I'm not defending NAB, but I am saying... And, I, and singled out the, the chief executive and the chairman. Certainly did, mm. um, but not just them. The practices in particular in their super sector were highlighted in a way that gives implicit endorsement for the way the other big institutions operate in super. And let me tell you, they were dancing a jig after that report, the other three. They couldn't believe they got off. Uh, as likely as they did. So, as I said, I'm no apologist for NAB, but um, let's not think that they're an outlier in their behaviours. Right. Um, this was a systemic issue across the industry, not, not confined to one institution. Hmm. Eva, what about ongoing conversations about culture yep. in the profit to member sector? I think it's important, and I guess that's why I called it out in my opening address that I think that's the call to action for, for our, our member funds, is how do you make sure if you've got that culture now that, that is really focused on putting the members first and, you know, you can answer hand on heart, um, you know, all of the questions that, that, um, that Ian has posed, then how do you preserve that? And if you're not there yet, then how, how do you make sure that you, you, you instil that culture in right across every layer of the business? I think it's incredibly important. These institutions are, you know, getting bigger and bigger and more and more people who are, were not there at the start of the creation of Industry yeah. Super. Um, you know, you've got more outsiders coming in who, who have different experiences, who have different expectations, who've worked in different cultures and who've worked in profit-making entities. How do you make sure that that culture, um, you know, really gets instilled um, right through the organisation? And I think that's, that's a real challenge and why I think we have to work together and hold each other accountable on it. Mm. And Hayne, didn't he, Alan, kept talking about um, greed and culture and he didn't have 
in his toolbox a kind of loyally response to that other than to admonish? Yes, I, I thought that was very noticeable. Um, just um, going back for one minute, though it's relevant to this question about lawyers, um, the uh, coalition's habit of appointing very, very conservative uh, judges. Um, in my time, the competition review, which was intended not to create any change, was headed by very conservative Judge Dawson, the Royal Commission on Unions by Hayden, mm -hmm. and this one, Hayden, is deeply conservative, but he's very sophisticated, so he had this strong attack, which kind of disguised a little bit the deep conservatism. Now, there was also, as you say, this deep, big attack on greed. Now, um, in uh, my own um, interest in this matter stems from the fact that the founder of modern economics, Adam Smith, discussed this question of greed or the pursuit of self-interest at length. He took it as a given, and the challenge is how to harness it to good effect and to prevent harm from it, and so his answer was, yes, let's have markets, but if we have strong competition, not monopolies, that will mean that we can regulate uh, and make productive the exercise of greed. Now, <coughs> in this uh, instance, um, I felt that um, uh, he didn't pursue how you really um, set up institutional arrangements that will <coughs> minimise the harm from greedy behaviour. He had a fairly conservative motion, let's just keep applying the law, rather than seeing if there could be different structures uh, that avoided there being deep conflict from the start. Yeah, uh, and, and that's, that's vertical integration, all those things, remuneration, all those things yeah. you and Adele nominated yeah. to start with. Um, and so, for example, even in the super field, you know, whether banks should be allowed to operate in the super field is a very shallow discussion of that issue, um, and it should have been gone into much more deeply. And royal commissions are the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity yeah. to get into those big issues, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen. I have to acknowledge that... Um, he has come up with quite a few recommendations which many people, many of us have been wanting for years and years and years and suddenly because of the changed climate of the hearings and so on, they look relatively easy. For example, in insurance, you know, for years we, the ACCC, everyone been pushing for the unfair contracts law to apply to insurance and for it not to be exempt. Well, he's just said it and it will happen. Yeah. Um, although... Which is monumental, right? It's, it's... Yeah. So there's a lot of little things like that. The only thing is that Royal Commission's finished. It's history. Who's it in the hands of? The government. And there will be enormous lobbying, uh, street fighting over the implementation of the recommendations. Just to take... Sorry, the fair contracts thing. Already the insurers are saying, sure, we'll go along with it, but they want the law to be defined so as to absolutely minimise it. And governments listen to those lobbyists a lot. Mm. Ian, I'm tempted to ask you a question about culture, unless you're burning to, to make another point. No, I'm not burning. <laughs> <laughs> Simmering. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm festering, but it's <laughs> more viral than, than anything. Um, I am interested in that conversation around culture. You know, you sort of have this notion, and, and it, it can feel, a, a, you know, a little bit um, touchy-feely, but you have somebody who perhaps only buys their child organic snacks, yeah? Uh, and they do the right thing, and maybe they drive a Prius. And then they get into um, a bank and they are behaving in ways that we saw at the Royal Commission, but they have a concept of themselves as a good person, right? And then mm. when they get into the bank, mm. there's a codified set of behaviours yeah. about what is acceptable that are kind of negotiated, as Adele was saying, 
with the uh, regulator sometimes is this, this, no, no, we'll iterate it down there, so that your personal sense of, of your ethical framework that you might have brought to the job 50 years ago as a banker has nothing to do with it. Your Prius is outside, the organic snack crumbs are, you know, are in, are in the leather seats. Well, they're probably not leather. Um, <laughs> how do you resolve that? Because you've got, a, you've got now a massive organisation. How do you instil that culture into people? Well, I've got to start off by saying I reckon you've got a, a pretty superficial view of what an ethical person is, a Prius driving vegetarian. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, look, th there's a hundred issues that emerge out of culture out of the Royal Commission, I think, but um, I think it's a really good point. We, we say you know, the retail sector are all evil people. Well, Commonwealth Bank's got 45, 50,000 people. Are mm. they all evil? Of course not. Many of them are friends. There are many, I'm sure, ex-Commonwealth Bank people here. Um, but there is an organisational construct that people operate within, mm -hmm. and this, I think this is your point. And that's why I think the um, people say, well, what's going to come of the Royal Commission? Um, are the banks going to change? Well, I don't know where that faith would come from, other than one source, and... That's the regulators. Now, can we be confident the regulators are up to the task? Well, not on past performance, but heaven help us if they don't step up to the plate now, because I do not have confidence that the sort of organisations that were called out for poor, for poor behaviour, and there's six in my mind that just had the spotlight shone on them and wilted under that spotlight. Um, you look at the changes that have been made, maybe there'll be more changes. I think the regulators and the referrals to, the, to ASIC in particular and what they do with those, they may herald a change in the organisations. But we haven't seen many changes of personnel. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially your point, I think. You come into an organisation and you, you get a sense of what's acceptable or yes. not. There was only one thing out of the 60 out of 69 days of hearings that surprised me. Most of the behaviours, I think, would have been... Uh, people here would have shrugged their shoulders and said, of course, we've known that for years. The only thing that surprised me was the number of commercial organisations that either clearly misled or blatantly lied to regulators. Right. I was taken aback by that. Right. But the fact that that sort of thing went on and perpetrated by some of the most senior people in those organisations and effectively condoned by them, you can hardly blame people down the road for thinking, well... The, the moral test here is, is not quite what I thought it was when I bought my Prius or I yes. buy my vegetarian food or whatever. I've got my non-work persona. I come to work and you know what? Well, my boss bullshits to the regulator. Oh, OK. That's how things are done here. That's culture. That's culture. Mm. And do you have any thoughts on how, as your organisation grows, how you ensure that if you have people who are bifurcated in that way right? Mm. They're good people mm. who've come from cultures mm. where they kind of make uh, judgments about what's acceptable that they wouldn't make outside. How do you ensure that those people understand what um, an industry superculture is? Yeah, well, it's, it's a real challenge for us as we get bigger, employ more people, and the, the pool of talent in Australia is relatively modest. Right. We, we don't just employ people from other super funds. We employ people from the outside of the relatively small industry fund sector and get a lot of people from the retail sector. So one of the... Um, we, we have two high-level filters when we employ people. One is whether the person can come in and do the job that we're employing them for mm. and whether they're able to, they've got the capacity to grow and help us improve as an organisation. But secondly, are they what we call an Australian super sort of person? Are they going to live our values, not just mouth them, but actually live them? And by and large, we've got that right, but we have employed people who have been terrific performers, but their behaviour hasn't been up to scratch. They haven't lived the organisation's values, and we've had to act on that. And it just sends a good message to the rest of the organisation, not that that's the principal purpose. The principal purpose is to ex exit a bad behaviour from the organisation. But it does send a good message to the rest of the organisation that this is not just um, stuff that's stuck on the, the lunchroom wall about the yes. values. If you don't live the values, you don't work here. Yeah. 
Let's um, hear Adele's response to another question, which is in the same vein. What's the one thing she was asked that Commissioner Hayne missed? I think one of the most important things that Hayne didn't recommend was remediation. Because at the end of the day, this whole Royal Commission is about people getting done over. And so they have to be put right. You know, lives have been destroyed, there's been suicides, people have had marriages broken. Many of those people, you know, they're just going to be left swinging. You know, I've spoken to many of them and they're saying that this report hasn't changed their lives. So it's really up to uh, the regulators, it's up to the institutions to start doing the right thing. Mm. So I hope that they do. <laughs> Isn't she wonderful? All right, um, I've got questions here on the screen that are coming in through the app, and if anyone's waving their hands around, I'm sure there'll be a microphone somewhere. Um, Eva, do you want to take this one? What do you think of the fact that self-managed funds didn't get a Guernsey at the Commission, didn't get a look in? Yeah, they were expressly excluded from mm. the terms of reference. Um, they did get a bit of a mention in the Productivity Commission <coughs> um, report. You know, my, my parents have left now, so I was, and that's why I can continue on. But um, you know, they, they were recommended into a into a self-managed super product when that when they shouldn't have been. Yeah. Um, you know, and and as a result of that, their retirement savings are you know virtually non-existent. I think there does need to be a lot closer look at what is happening in self-managed super funds, particularly for those people that are that are moving across don't have, you know, the, the minimum capital to make it, you know, sort of efficient and worthwhile um, and, and are unlikely to ever, ever get there. Um, and then if, if they're making bad decisions or their accountant or their advisors are making bad decisions for them and they end up on the public purse, then we, all of us as taxpayers, have to pay for that. And I think there needs to be stronger controls in place for self-managed super. What do you think? Uh, Alan, the Productivity Commission found that, you know, with less than half a million dollars SMSFs tend to perform significantly worse. Does the government, in a system where there's compulsion, have a responsibility to protect people from themselves? Uh, yes, and uh, that's true. The P Productivity Commission did bring out poor performance by quite a few of the self-managed um, schemes, and something has to be done about it. What the, re what the answer is, I'm not entirely clear. I'm also concerned about the hidden fees and charges in these self-managed things, which are not properly disclosed. And most of the people with those funds don't understand all the stapling of funds that go right through the system mm. and that also cause their performance to be inferior. Yeah, their performance is never measured against what, you know, the average industry fund returns might be. They, they, I think they live in a, in a completely separate bubble and don't have that comparator, which is important. There's another question here. Do you, anyone, have the same faith as Commissioner Hayne that superannuation has the right regulators now? Well, uh, I could say a couple of things about it. Um, you will see a lot more action from ASIC now. Um, it's being urged to go to court. Um, there's a change at the top. Um, they've decided, already announced, that they've got a new approach, which is the why not litigate approach when they come across some fault in the system. Uh, they're surely going to react to all the criticism, including by the Royal Commissioner. Um, having said that, um, I have some concerns about how that will play out. The Commissioner himself, in his report, expressed some caution and concerns about how this would play in future. One is that uh, there's a very, very broad remit that ASIC has. It has a very large number of pieces of legislation that it has to look after. And on top of that, uh, there's a huge burden on the regulator in relation to dealing with the problems identified by the Royal Commission. Too big a burden, as I've said, and others, it would have been better to do something structural. Um, also, uh, the cases are not easy. We'll only know how they go after five years. Often point out that although I've been a big critic of ASIC for many, many years, 
It was a big problem when I started in 1991 at the Trade Practices Commission. Even then, people were saying it wasn't doing the job properly. There have been a regular set of reviews repeating that and nothing's happened. But what is also true is that that area of law, corporations law, is much less clear than, say, the competition law. It's right. Compared. So they do have a much harder time in court. And one of the points that Commissioner Hayne didn't bother to mention was that one of the reasons regulation has not worked well in this area has been the courts and their legalism and their very tough demands before they'll find any fault. So I thought he glossed over the problems coming from the High Court down in this, in this field. Okay. Let, let me turn to Ian. Ian, are you ever scared of the regulator? Big pardon? Are you ever scared of the regulator? <laughs> well, I've got to be careful. I'm uh, speaking tomorrow in Sydney to uh, the APRA Regulatory and Law Enforcement Division. So <laughs> I must say, after the caning they got from the Royal Commission, I'm expecting them to be eating raw meat as I walk yeah. into the room. Um, look, I think, I think we're in danger of the pendulum swinging too far, but that's the nature when it swings too far one way. Mm. So the Royal Commissioner... In fact, I thought the regulators copped the biggest stick out of the Royal Commission. <coughs> Retail sector copped a bit, but mm. you look at what was said... Of that's what Adele said, wasn't she? She was stunned at the regulators getting such a thrashing. Yeah, I think she was saying she was stunned at how bad they were and yes. they deserved the thrashing. Yes, that, yes. That's one view. But they certainly copped a thrashing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and both heads, the heads of both regulators did a significant mea culpa at the Royal Commission and said we're going to be much harder, much tougher. And I think most of us here have seen that already. APRA is taking a much more aggressive approach in their interaction with funds. And frankly, they and ASIC are the hope of the side. Not much in the way of legislative change will come out of the Royal Commission, as far as super is concerned, on, on this issue, the mm. regulatory framework. Um, I don't have great faith that, left to their own devices, the institutions that had the finger pointed at them are going to lift their game and be uh, wonderful corporate citizens. Yes, I see. It's, it's left to the regulator. Now, they've conceded they haven't operated as well as they might. Some of the stuff we've heard suggests their intent on moving the pendulum a long way might actually catch some of us that are doing the right thing because that's what happens when the pendulum swings violently. But frankly, I hope it does swing because we've got to lift the standards. And as I said, I don't have faith in the industry to do it absent a strong and aggressive regulator. There's a question come through, Jared Noon's asking about um, the Productivity Commission's proposal for uh, 10 best in class. You've answered from your perspective on that one, Eva, and also on the Hain Commission's idea of a stapled account. Um, and I noticed that Labor's committed uh, uh, to that recommendation of stapling that default account to people as they move jobs. Um, do you think that um, the stapling would improve outcomes for members? You're asking me? Mm. Mm. So this is a difficult question, I think. You know, for the majority of, of Australians, one, one account is completely appropriate. Uh, and it's, you know, there's only a handful of people really who, sh who in certain circumstances would choose to have more than, more than one account. So the stapling is, and how that works, is, is the issue. We, you know, the, the, the view from AIST is that, you know, most people should only have one account. They should have one account throughout their life, but not necessarily the same account because it's attached to your workplace. It's part of the industrial relations system and people change between one career and another and you know the 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 fund that you started your working career with might not be the appropriate yeah. fund as as you go along mm. but yes absolutely we have to find a mechanism for um, you know ensuring that people only have the one account for life and now with the protecting you super package and and um, the new systems the online services with the ATO um, you know, for, for new job seekers, uh, will will help sort out some of those multiple account problems that we do have to resolve. Okay. And another question: How big of an impact do you feel single touch payroll will have for funds, and how relevant is default super going forward? 
a significant um, impact I think that single touch payroll will have um, and now capturing all small employers too. So it'll have a significant impact I think on unpaid super. It'll be a lot easier for the ATO to track down uh, those employers that are might be paying wages but not paying um, the workers the, the super that they're entitled to. And I, in terms of default super, absolutely believe it's more important than ever, but we need to strengthen the system and make it work right for people. Alan, just on that uh, stapling issue that yeah. uh, Jared raised. This is an example of the point I was making earlier about debates in the industry being very inward looking and very industry centric. Right. So we're talking about should the fund go with the member or should um, the member join a new fund? What, what we say is forget about stapling a member to a fund. The member should be stapled to their money. <laughs> and, and the mechanism by which, which that occurs is a secondary consideration. We want to reduce the number of multiple accounts, as Eva said. If the money is stapled to the member, whether it's the um, Productivity Commission's proposal or the uh, um, auto rollover proposal, doesn't matter so much so long as they both operate efficiently and low cost. But for goodness sake, this is, this is an example where we have let ourselves and in particular the members down. There were 33 million accounts in the industry yes. in 2010. It's down to about 26 million now, about 15 per cent. So that's good. That's good progress. But how in God's name did it get to 33 million? Because we didn't come up with a solution to it. Yeah. So we run the risk again of having a, a solution imposed on us that we don't think is a good one. Well, we've invited that unless we come up with a solution that operates for members. Uh, and, and just briefly your view on best in show? Look, there's nobody barracking for best in show now. It was no. Peter Costello's idea. Um, the Finn editorialised for it. Kelly O'Dwyer promoted it. There's a common connection between those three. And I don't see anybody else yes. pushing for it. Yes, I haven't spent a lot of time debating it on the basis that I don't think it'll ever see the light of day. Um, Alan, can I ask you this question? Would the panel comment on the possible introduction of the future fund as a potential provider of default super in the future? Okay, well, I've got one sort of significant point to make um, about that. That's the question of competitive neutrality. Um, it's been a long accepted principle in the world of competition policy that if the government is to be in business and to compete, it must do so on an equally level position as uh, the other competitors. Mm. So, for example, uh, it should pay the same tax. It should not have advantages from it being government. For example, uh, the borrowing costs are typically a lot lower. Um, there's a whole lot of other benefits. So, before I even talk about the core issue, I think it would have to be uh, an essential requirement that uh, the government operates on a level footing. Now, if we were talking about public enterprises, government businesses and electricity or something like that, it is fairly easy to produce competitive neutrality by putting a tax on them, by costing uh, the uh, interest rates at which they borrow and adding a penalty for that, etc. Um, I find it harder to see how you could get competitive neutrality in, the, in this field if the future fund mm. came in it. It's got such a huge competitive advantage just from the fact that it's the government. It will be hugely attractive, I would have thought, to people with uh, money to, to go in with it. Um, so I'm yet to be convinced that it can be achieved. Um, I... Uh, also, on the other hand, I discount the point that the Productivity Commission made against it. The Productivity Commission said, um, well, if the government's running it and performance is poor, then the government will have to find money from the taxpayer yes. to fund it. I'm sceptical that that would ever happen. Um, Thank you. But, yes. um, and so I'm a bit sceptical of that reason for opposing it. But I am more worried about whether there could ever be fair competition. Yeah, that's interesting, because I read that part of it and thought, great, you know, your hip <laughs> pocket twitches yet again, doesn't it? Another coal-fired power station. OK. Um, Eva, last question. How can we improve super outcomes for women when we still have wage inequality at 14.1%? Yeah. 
Well, I don't have the answer, and if you know anyone did, we, I guess we would have solved that problem by now. Um, you know, wage inequality is something that we as employers have to all take responsibility for, and I think it's good to see that um, it's on the ALP. ALP's priority list of things to do should they get into government to really focus on, um, you know, try, trying to get employers to do more in relation to, to wage equality. Having said that, there's a lot obviously that the superannuation industry can do or that government can do to assist uh, in closing the gap, the retirement savings gap. Um, we're pleased to see the announcement about SG pay on paid parental leave and abolishing the 450 threshold. Mm. Um, however, it's not going to be enough to close the gap. 12%, getting us to 12% SG is incredibly important, but it lifts both men and women. It doesn't close the gap, but hopefully it helps with adequacy at the end of the day. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in this space. I know that um, you know the industry and, and some of the unions are getting together with women in super uh, to do more research to figure out exactly what, what the answer is, but it's going to require a cash boost um, for, for you know low-income workers particularly for women. And, and, and we are three, two, one out of time. But um, at, on International Women's Day, there was an interesting woman came into our studio, an advisor to Michelle Obama, and she, I won't quote the names of the companies because I, I won't absolutely get them right, but absolutely going through, figuring out that that woman and that man are doing essentially the same job, but for whatever caring reasons, she's being underpaid. Um, they began by saying, well, let's have a look across our organisation. That can't possibly be happening. And, oh, my goodness, they had a $2 million bill and they literally cut checks. There you go. You've been underpaid. You've been underpaid. You've been underpaid. I mean, is that, that's the only thing that makes a difference in the end if, you've got a, if you want to bridge a gap quickly, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I'm not saying that that's the solution, but that would be the only way to click your fingers and solve it. That's right. And you've got a budget for it. It's not, and it's not everybody's got that sitting yes. there ready to go. You've, yeah. got to, you've got to plan for it and prepare for it. And, and, and you've got to revisit it over time because things slip again for whatever reason, unfortunately. Um, maybe it's because men are better asking for pay rises than women, but um, you know it's, it can't be static. It's something that has to be you know revisited time and time again to make sure that that equality is there mm, in an innovative way. Please thank the members of the panel and Adele very much.